Hey, it's Warren again, and uh, today I want to te teach you about one of the foundational stories of Western culture, which is the story of Adam and Eve, or the myth of Adam and Eve. I want you to make sure that you understand what I mean by myth. I've written it down on this board, that myths are stories that teach us about ourselves, others, and the world around us. Uh, myths answer the whys and the hows. Myth, uh, even though popular par parlance says that myths are uh, untruths, that's not the definition I'm using. I'm not calling this account untrue. This is a very, very, very rich myth, and it has to do with Adam and Eve. And besides that, the other characters are God. And depending on where you come from, uh, Satan or the serpent. Those are the four characters in this story. I want you to turn to the, uh, uh, I want you to pull up on your, on your uh, computer the New An International Version of Genesis 2 verses 4 through 25 because there are, so it's a New International Version if you plug in NIV it will come right up. If you plug in NIV, Adam and Eve, it will come right up. The reason I encourage you to use NIV or the New International Version is because it's understandable. Now, most of you probably have uh, the King James Version of the Bible, and that is a beautiful work. But the translators that, the, that King James got together back 400 years ago, uh, they believed that one being wrote all the Bible and that made it impossible for them to actually translate it correctly also and it's beautiful like for me the Christmas story even though I don't believe in a God the Christmas story in the King James Version is the best for me because that's what I grew up with however if you want to understand what the what Bible really says you you need a more updated translation and the people who put together, the translators who put together the New International Version actually had access to the original text, whereas with King James they did not. So, um, pause the video, Google New, New International Version, Adam and Eve story, and it should pull right up. All right. By the way, Bible means because it's the most uh, held book in the United States in Western culture period and Bible means library <clears throat> it means books books so this is uh, the myth of Adam and Eve and it will give many 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 explanations about why things are the way they are and how they came to be and so you should keep a list after I give this lecture you should probably uh, well you you will be doing an assignment where you mark down at least 25 different questions that this myth answers some of the myths that I've already told you the Greek myths answer just one or two questions this will answer dozens and dozens of questions all right, so once again, before I get started, myths are stories that teach us about ourselves, others, and the world around us. They answer the whys and the hows. Okay, let me get off that, that screen. All right, so this begins with, this is the account of the heavens and earth when they were created when the Lord God made the heavens and the earth so right away even that first verse which is verse 4 from chapter 2 because there are two there are two completely different creation stories in Genesis the first one goes from chapter 1 to verse 3 in chapter 2 or um, and um, the reason for that is that they didn't divide it in any chapters this was oral tradition and later on people went back and said 
we have to have a way of finding things. How are we going to do that? We'll number the verses. So, in a in a a perfect world, you would have the first story being one chapter, but <laughs> humans are not perfect. So, this starts in Genesis chapter two, verse four. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. So right away, that first verse in the story, verse 4, chapter 2, answers that uh, God, Lord God, made the heavens and the earth. Now, no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain onto the earth, and there and there was no one to work the ground. Now, who are the people who work the ground? The people who work the ground are farmers, right? And this is an agrarian uh, myth, and that's how people got by, is by working the ground. And, and working the ground and staying in the same place only happened about 12,000 years ago. So this records that idea. Verse 5, let's see, verse 6. There was no one to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust and ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. All right, so right there we have the creation of, of humans and Whenever you create a person out of nothing, such as the earth or wood, can you think of a story where uh, an old man created a little son out of wood? If you can, you'd be thinking about Geppetto and Pinocchio, right? That's called a golem. A golem is a human created out of nothing. Now the Lord God had planted a, a garden in the east, in Eden, and he put the man he had formed. So God in this story is a planter. He is a farmer. And he creates a man out of the earth in order to take care of it. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden were the tree of, the, of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we have uh, a tr two trees. We have many, many trees. But in the middle, we have two trees. Tree of life. and tree of knowledge. And all of you, I presume, are here in this class to learn knowledge. All right, so in some ways, this is an anti-intellectual story, but it's knowledge of good and evil. Is, is what is different about this particular tree. <clears throat> now, there's a choice that's being offered in this myth where one can choose the tree of life, live forever, or to have knowledge. And if you're familiar with, with this myth, you'll know that Adam and Eve choose knowledge. And this is a knowledge that makes them like a god. Okay? And in each of your lives, every day, you have to make decisions using your knowledge about what is good and what is bad. What is right, what is wrong. What is fantastic and what is evil. In a river watering the garden f flowed from Eve Eden. 
that's in verse 10. From there it was separated into four headwaters, and now we have a bunch of explanation about geography that doesn't have to do with the story. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havila, where there is gold. The gold of the Latin is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is Gion. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. And you can look on your map and see the Tigris River. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. And you can look on your map of the world and see the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it and take care of it. So Adam was the original farmer. And the Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree, any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, it's important uh, that you understand that the tree of knowledge actually in all Latin languages means the tree of science. And right now in today's world, we have people who deny science, who deny knowledge. They say that it doesn't matter. And so you can wrestle with that idea and think about what contemporary uh, happenings that you see where people deny knowledge. Adam and Eve did not want to deny knowledge, as we will find out later on, right? So Adam is promised that if he eats from knowledge, he will die. He will die instead of living forever. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground. Sorry, the Lord God said, "It is not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him." And so helper is how this characterizes the woman or Eve. She becomes a helper. And this is the beginning of patriarchy in this mythology. <clears throat> now patriarchy patriarchy means that men rule over women. <clears throat> and that is what happened uh, about 8,000 years ago is that men started ruling over women. It was not that case for the 200 plus thousand years of humanity's existence. But this myth, myth actually uh, puts mytholo the mythology, the explanation that this is why men are in charge. Okay, so he creates a helper. Now the Lord God had formed out of the, out of the ground all the wild animals, all the birds in the sky, he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that's what its name was. So we have the naming of animals. What's interesting about this is uh, uh, we speak many, many languages, right? And so apparently in this myth, there is one name for each animal, but I'm speaking English. I don't speak Hebrew, and that's what this was written in. It was Hebrew, and uh, I call my dogs dogs. I call my cats cats. Now, in Spanish, my dogs are called perros. My cats are called gatos. There are different names for all the animals throughout all the thousands of languages. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. Once again, it's a very agrarian because we have, in addition to planting, we have livestock. And livestock are the animals that feed humans. And then they're different than all the wild animals. So, for example, I have a cow that I'm raising to slaughter, and that cow is called carne, which means meat in Spanish. And I am going to slaughter that cow and eat that cow and feed it to my family and my friends. But I also have uh, animals like Athena, 
who is a cat and I'm not going to slaughter her at all. She's different than livestock. I also have chickens. Now I've named some of my chickens. For example, uh, for the dozen chickens that I have, the head rooster is called KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken. And I say that to him when he's acting up. Now I haven't named the other two roosters that I have, but I did send two roosters away from the house because they were trying to fuck their mother. And we don't want that, <laughs> okay? We have to have the mother who is called Persephone, which is one of the myths that I talked to you about. Uh, she likes to keep having babies. And so she just had a new uh, hatch of, of three babies. So I have KFC, I have Persephone, and then I have a bunch of other birds, okay? Um, and wild animals, I'm thinking like tigers and stuff like that. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the God in this story has not uh, come up with that helper. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, which is anesthesia, right, in today's terms. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed it the place with flesh. So this is, in Western culture, the first documentation of surgery. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. This is another example of male birth fantasy, like I talked to you about in the myth of Kronos. So, in essence, Adam gives birth to Eve after being un under anesthesia. He has some sort of cesarean section that takes out a rib. And next thing you know, you have a woman. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, I'm interested in knowing this. If you know any male that has given birth, I'd really love to talk to him. But in this foundational myth from Western culture, we have a man giving birth to a full-grown woman. With intervention, of course. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Now, that has nothing to do with the narrative because it doesn't, it doesn't move the narrative along. It just explains why people have sex. When people have sex, they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So think about this idea that um, according to this myth, nakedness was never shameful, all right? Never shameful. But it is today, especially in our United States culture, that uh, is influenced by Puritans who actually thought that seeing an ankle was a turn-on. Can you imagine when I am inside a classroom and I look around, I can see almost everybody's ankles and I'm not turned on. Maybe something's wrong with me, but um, people originally did not feel ashamed. That's what culture did when it was laid on top of them. When um, I was a little boy, myself and my twin sister, and we were about two years old, whenever our older siblings, who were old enough to be our parents, because there were ten children in my family, whenever they had a date, we'd run out and we'd answer the door naked when we were two, one and a half, two, two and a half years old. And, uh, of course, that was a shock to the people who were dating, but hopefully it was... Uh, a reminder of birth control.
All right, and I will give you, because my computer ended at that point for some weird reason, I will give you uh, the next interpretation, uh, the next reading with my next video. Thank you.